Look, this is how fancy, you know, automobile engines are, are produced. It's actually very wise, it sounds very sexy. A watchmaker is skilled, it's like a it's like a soldier is skilled. They're like, take your gun apart and put it back together. Like, it's kind of like what they do all day long. It's funny because because when I mentioned this technique, this two-fold assembly to somebody at some other brand, they said, oh yeah, well, we don't do that. We just get it right the first time. Welcome to a blog to watch weekly with Rick and Ariel, but most importantly, David. This week we have Ariel's continuing adventures with Chopard, something new from Christopher Ward, some Moon Swatch and Scottish Watch news for Rick from Lings in Glasgow, but absolutely no Resonance Watch for him. Will others now follow as Cartier announces price increases and we review new watches from WT author Timex featuring Mrs. A Blog to Watch, Hublot and A. Langer and Zona. Enjoy the show! Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. We are joined by the ever illustrious Ariel Adams and this week also by David. How are you, David? How are you, Ariel? I'm great. I'm great as well. It's just finally, you know, I missed last week. And uh, on that note, before before we get started, I just wanted to uh, give a quick shout out and a hello to Christy for the lovely <laughs> voice that she lends us every week to promote the uh, the next episode. So just hello there, Christy. I wonder if Christy's going to be listening. I-, I think Christy probably will be listening. So Ariel, how is your backside from? Um, sitting in a Chopard rally car or whatever kind of car it was going up whatever kind of highway it was in the States. And you can tell I don't know a great deal about this event you were involved in. Well, I think rally events for vintage cars are more or less the same all over the world. And that is a bunch of people who own these vehicles get together to drive them. They they need to be together because between them, someone always knows how to fix something. <laughs> Somebody always, always knows some piece of trivial knowledge. And together, they can afford to get themselves out of a lot of trouble. One gentleman really brought seven cars with him because he assumed that some would break down and he just wanted to play with some what? others <laughs> yes 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 so that's that's sort of what we're talking about um and i spent about seven or eight hours in the car of a 1957 porsche 356 which in the scheme of vintage sports cars it rides pretty well depending on the version but yeah after that many hours the touring seats we had I think they were anticipating one of those like Gilligan's Island three hour tours. That's about uh, what they're for. But it was it was great to be with the the famous driver, Patrick Long, former Formula One driver and who uh, knows cars very, very well. So I felt like I was in good hands. It was kind of amusing where at one point the event people were congratulating one that no, that there was no cars that flipped over the first day. I think they said shiny, <laughs> shiny sides up only. They had some type of like insider way of saying no it's car amazing. flipped over. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize this was such a risk. What kind of speeds are you doing in these old cars? Well, that's the great thing about these automobiles is because they're old and quite primitive compared to today's cars, it's sort of like a roller coaster where you're going quite slow but it feels like you're going very very fast so you know 60 miles an hour is very very dramatic in these automobiles well at least you had one with a roof on there were some there that were had no roofs yes i I suppose you're in california in this country that would be a problem in your country maybe not so much uh well i mean people complained that it was hot and and they got burned but you know overall these were beautiful roads and uh, chopard watches is a sponsor of the original millimiglia which is in italy the california meal is actually officially licensed and is sort of uh, an, an offshoot of it run by different people. It's an enjoyable thing. A lot of car brands participate in these enthusiast automotive events for a very good reason. The types of people that go there uh, like watches, uh, own watches, and are, are buying. So uh, Chopard is definitely in that that world. But it also lives it because the uh, the family, the Schoifele family, they're car lovers. They participate in these rallies as well. So it actually makes sense and is sort of good to be a part of that interesting world. So did the Chopard family bring their own cars or did they just get the first choice of the best cars that everybody else brought? They have their own cars. Yeah, yeah. They There was a car that was branded Chopard. David, you know more about this. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in car, Friedrich Schaeffler, the co-president of Chopard and the guy responsible for the watch side of Chopard and not the, the jewelry side. He is he's a big car collector, actually. He, he owns a bunch of vintage cars. Basically, they just joined Mille Miglia, which is the Italian kind of original version of these races. They joined the races over 30 years ago. I actually drove the Mille Miglia for two, two out of the four days in 2019, which was one of the oh, nice. one of the most amazing driving experiences and just, you know, broadly speaking experiences ever and of course you know I, I was there with Chopard and Chopard brought like seven or eight cars and Mr. Schreifele was supposed to lead us to the start of the race because obviously it's in Italy you have absolutely no idea what's happening and you know how to do this he's been doing this for like 30 years and so 
he was taking the convoy of our seven cars towards the, the, the start line. And there's a specific time when you have to be there, like roughly I- Italian, but specific. And, uh, <laughs> and and he went for this overtake of this lorry uh, in his um, galving Mercedes, which was much more powerful than the little Abarth that we were driving that had four tiny cylinders and maybe 60 horsepower or something like that. Sure, I mean, that's a lot for a car that weighs, you know, ne- next to nothing. But he managed to do the overtake and none of us, none of us could actually keep up with him. So we got lost. The, the entire first day of the Mila Media, we were lost. <laughs> so <laughs> we were just following the Mila Media signs, the red arrows you know that actually appear on, on, on Chopar watches and that's how we kept the track and we actually made it where we were supposed to go we were just never on time we were like way too early because we we have basically undercut half of the <laughs> half of the cars like literally a hundred cars I want to add in something here that I learned okay and that's that the Millimiglia is an interesting event because it's not a race but it's sort of like you have to be at checkpoints at specific times so like you, you it's it's weird it's about pacing I wouldn't I don't really know what to say it's a pacing thing and with the california mill we didn't have any signs and there is a special app that you you use but our app never worked because we were never approved so me and the driver had to use the paper instructions (laughs) <laughs> and great. it'd been so long that <laughs> since I like you know navigated this way, and it was interesting, but it was uh, you know kind of went with a retro theme. But that, that's that's as thick as a phone book. I mean, it, it's it's you know it's so easy to get lost in that. We only had that thing. Yeah, it's the, pretty the, big. It's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so and so yeah, so they are big car characters. And at the time when I wrote this article about this experience, I I researched the history of the Mila Milia and Chopar, and it goes back to 1988, so something like 34 years now when they started giving out keychain rings or something small like a little gift from Chopar because they were there it was not for a promotion it was just something to hand out to the people who were there like hey we're Chopar here's something nice or whatever and you know bear in mind that 30 odd years ago Chopar was a much different brand than it is today I mean it's much more developed and much more successful today than it was 30 something years ago and then in 1989 they started this collaboration and it was in 19 whatever it was I think it was 1994 that they first did this Dunlop tire pattern strap which is basically associated with the Mila Mila and Chopar watches. And in this article, I stayed, I actually saw Chris Harris, you know, one of these very famous car journalist guys, wear one of these watches. And he's not really a watch guy. And even he chose a Chopar Mila Mila watch because it is the car lover's watch. It's not a watch that says about you that you like watches. It's a watch that says about you that you like cars. And I feel like the, the Mila Mila is much more successful in that regard than, for example, a Daytona. Everyone wears a Daytona. And obviously, it's supposed to be a motorsport watch. But... I, you know, I would be very shocked if, if one out of a hundred people would say, "Oh, you, I'm sure you're wearing a Daytona because you like motorsports." Nobody does that, and nobody says that. And the Mila Miglia is underrated. It's an underrated yeah, yeah. piece. Yeah, and and some of these are really beautifully made, beautifully crafted. I really like the Dunlop uh, pattern rubber strap. And yeah, so so that's the story of of Mila Miglia in a nutshell. Go read the article from 2019. It's called "The Chopar Mila Miglia is Indeed a True Car Lover's Watch." That's the article in the blog to watch. Thank you, David. We will link to that in the show notes. Remember, if you take part in the comment section of the show notes that round up all the podcast content from a blog to watch each week on a Saturday then you can be in with a chance of winning something from the a blog to watch shop and if you didn't know we had a blog to watch shop then go to a blog to watch.com and click on the link that says store and then you can have a look at all the goodies that are there David is busy researching lots of new stuff going to be added soon other news from the watch world this week briefly swatch with regards to the moon swatch put out another announcement saying nope we're still selling the moon swatch in stores only we're not going online do we think that this is somebody in swatch suddenly realizing how many non moon swatch swatches are selling by getting folk into the shops you know, um here, here's something interesting that i i was just told the like less than a week ago someone um went to the store in Vienna because, you know, I'm, I'm based in Budapest and, and that's the closest store where you can actually get your hands, supposedly, on a moon, moon swatch. And he drove there and he went in there or maybe he had something to do there, whatever. And they told him that he can't even look at the watches. It's not that he can't buy them. It's not even on display. He'd, and they will not take it out from him. There's no way he could look at it. So that's the point where we are in the scarcity of, of Moon Swatch that you can't, you can't even look at it. I thought that was very interesting. That's that's a far throw from online availability. Maybe they just didn't like the look of him. I mean, I've seen it them displayed in a lot of places. You can't buy them, but at least you can look at them. We've seen some of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ariel. <laughs> 
other people doing things this week in the watch world that we've not yet covered on a blog to watch is Christopher Ward. We had Mike France on the show a few weeks ago. Their new Aquitaine range is out. Looks a bit kind of 50 Fathom-ish. First reactions from anybody? Haven't seen it yet. Yep. Nope. Keeping your fingers on the pulse there, gents. Look, you know what? <laughs> this is the thing. I am. I have more watches than I can write about being sent out to me in terms of you know emails and information and things like that. I, I don't need to go hunting anymore. And I assume that by the time a brand is spoken about enough or a model is spoken about, I'll, I'll hear about it. It's not like something's going to like be popular for a year and I'm not going to hear about it. I'm not in any rush. I've seen so many watches and brands come and go. I know that hype doesn't have anything to do with excitement. You know, Christopher Ward watches, they they do a good job, but it, it's still the idea of, hey, you liked it in this more expensive thing. Now see our slightly less expensive version of it, which again is a very effective business model, but it's not going for originality. And so for me, if I miss one of their things, I don't feel like I'm missing out too much. I mean, the th- this is a nice looking watch but as you say it's reminiscent of something else being done more cost effectively and with higher availability but that is the business model that seems to be working for them so you can check out we'll no doubt hear more about it on a blog to watch and Carty announced a price increase this week is this the inflation that we spoke about I think on last week's show or it might be in the week before starting to show in the watch world they do mention inflation in the interview that I read do we expect to see 10 12 15 percent increase Increases across the board. We do. We do know that Swiss watch brands do like putting their prices up whenever they can. I would look at this a little bit more practically speaking. Cartier is still the money maker at the Richemont Group, and the Richemont Group needs needs money and a lot of the brands are still struggling for a variety of reasons and it's very easy especially seeing what rolex has done for these brands to feel you know what we think we're just going to increase our prices and it's actually going to increase our demand it sends a tacit signal to everyone like oh you're increasing your your prices that must mean you're very confident about your volume of sales it's sort of seen as a pride point it can backfire and when it backfires what brands tend to do is quietly discontinue overpriced models and just come out with new ones that are more effectively priced and you tend to see this as a bit of a cycle and what i mean is new watches come in that are very very expensive and maybe they don't sell and then you know watches come in underneath them and then the tendency is to go back up in price that's the funny thing no matter how low they go in price the tendency is always to go up in price that sort of seems to be the natural trajectory of most of these brands is to come out with increasingly expensive watches so it's not surprising at all you know i think that that richemont has probably its fair share of pressure on on cartier and i think it's also like i said uh an ego point they think that they can do it so we'll see what happens they'll find out very soon if that's effective or or not for them there's enough serious people at cartier that they're going to be monitoring this closely well let's not forget that when they overshoot with pricing and they price themselves out of the reach of people or or out of being uh, you know competitive they have they, they have stuck inventory and you know cartier when i hear the word cartier i always remember this news back from 2018 when the guardian reported that cartier had well, they say destroyed, but I would say, you know, bought back some 400 million, 400 million pounds, which is like $600 million at the time worth of watch um, inventory from the world. You know, it was a two year buyback and they did it to avoid them being sold at knockdown prices, you know, so that, you know, to, to prevent discounting from those high prices. So it can be really costly, uh, really fast. And, you know, what none of these brands can afford is to become a discounted brand because, you know, the moment you start, you know, selling these watches out the back door, you know, with like 50% off to gray market dealers to slap another, you know, 15, 20% back on the price, you become a brand that people can buy at 30 off or 40 off and they get used to that. And, you know, once they have a watch at 30 off, they will get bored with it and then they will sell it at like half off from retail, I'm speaking. And then people will learn that, oh, okay, a Cartier watch is worth half as much in a couple of years than what you originally paid for it. So this is why one of the reasons why Cartier uh, purchased back all this, you know, $600 million worth of inventory. So that's that's the flip side when you price yourself out, uh, far out from the reach of people. Finally, before we move on to the articles we're going to feature on a blog to watch this week, just because I'm in Scotland and a bit of local colour, some news out of the world-famous Argyle Arcade which is that one of the main tenants in there, Langs of Glasgow, it's been there since 1840. I don't mean 20 to 7. It's been there since 1840. Is moving out of the arcade and onto the main 
shopping street into a five-story building. So despite all these price increases we're speaking about, some big retailers still seem to think that there's lots of money in bricks and mortar shopping. Are you guys seeing any activity locally or hearing of any internationally in terms of investment by the authorized dealers? I have been seeing an enormous amount of that over the pandemic. You know, a lot of these dealers have been investing more than the watch brands, at least from what I've been seeing. And Many of them are investing in themselves, and a lot of that is the retail space. They're doubling down on what is they're good at. We've seen this in the past. What they're doing is they're improving their spaces. They're getting better spaces. They're getting multiple spaces. What a lot of them are not doing right now, interestingly enough, is loading their sh- shops with brands, meaning it isn't like, oh my God, we want to sell everything. Let's just take aboard all the brands. There's a little bit of that, but for the most part, it's mostly the space they want to solidify their position in the market. They want to see be seen as the nicest one. You know, with, with the competitive brands like the Rolexes and things of the world, they want to be in the best store and the best spot. And these brands compete. They do compete with the retailers for the prestige of being the nicest store in town, um, for example. So this is this is a, a, a quite a common thing. It's happening, you know, over there in Scotland, in America, yep. and, and around the world. Again, I don't know necessarily about Asia, but in terms of Europe, And in America, it seems to be happening quite a bit. Well, certainly the plan in Glasgow, which probably follows uh, the plan in a lot of places, is this five-story building. There'll be a top floor that's hospitality. And also there's rumours that Oudmar Piguet are opening a dedicated space, uh, which would effectively be next door to this boutique. So, yeah, there's brands and traditional authorised dealers all investing in bricks and mortar, certainly in this part of the world. But anyway, let's get on with the rest of the show. Watches and Wonders 2022, we saw what nobody saw coming, which was a titanium Alanga and Zuna watch. We've seen them produce a steel watch every once in a while. They were extremely rare. And, uh, you know, it's not that they were collectible because, you know, basically they they were unobtainium, just one or two steel watches here and there is nothing. And all other Alanga and Zuna watches always were produced in precious metals, you know, gold and platinum, basically. And now, out of the blue, we see this watch on a titanium bracelet, no less, and of course a titanium case. This is the uh, Lunga Odysseus, which is their quasi uh, sports watch with 120 meters of water resistance. It, it is them tapping into the integrated bracelet luxury sports watch market, you know, basically defined by Rolex and by the Nautilus and by the Royal Oak and basically 20 other brands at this point who have tried and did, uh, you know, get their share out of it. Uh, the Odysseus debuted something like three or four years ago at the price of around $30,000. And this one is closer to 60, uh, 50 something, 55, actually it's $56,500 in titanium. So almost double the price. But even with that in mind, you know, probably they, they will be sold out in no time because they only make 250 pieces. It's typical longer in the sense that they produce something with t- tremendous effort and they realize that, oh, okay, that's really difficult to do at this level. So we can only make so many. So we only make 250. So, you know, we will charge almost double and see what happens. And what happens is that people for sure will buy this up. And it's not a question whether or not they can sell it. It's more like which of the um, longer collectors will be able to pick it up. Ariel, have you had a chance to see the titanium with this? I did get a chance to take a look at it off of the CEO of Alonganzona, uh, Mr. Mm. Schmidt and... It was great. I mean, look, they did all the finishing themselves. They buy this bracelet. They're very open with the fact that they have suppliers for their cases and bracelets. And these are pretty good companies. But the finishing wasn't good enough. And that's and that's true. You tend to see that. So they you know, deconstructed the bracelet and did all the finishing themselves, which is pretty much the only way to do it. So if you want one of the most interesting and well-polished and cut and machined titanium watch and bracelet combos, it has... All the great personality of a Longe. It's super legible. The calendar movement is cool. It's an automatic. There's people that complain about it. There's people that say it's not very attractive. It's different looking. I think that people need to give it a chance. Uh, my, you know, some people, it's like their grail watch. And other people are like, oh, I don't like that. I, I'm not going to try to convince anyone to like it. But I think that people who are watch lovers sort of solidly agree that like, you know, if they were had a chance to get one of those, they're definitely going to do it. I feel like it belongs to one of those one of one of the one of those um, categories where a watch is designed to look awesome when you wear it and feel great when you wear it and just be a great uh, companion, you know, throughout, you know, daily life. And some of those watches 
don't always look that attractive on images, not even our own images, let alone, you know, computer renders that the brands usually produce. So I've seen this happen. And the Odysseus is precisely that watch. And especially in titanium, I felt like, you know, if this was the if, if this was the watch that I had to wear for the rest of my life, I would not feel let down at all. Maybe I would when I beat up the <laughs> titanium, which is kind of <laughs> uh, kind of soft but at this, uh, and beautiful at the same time, the way that they uh, finished it. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's that kind of watch that you have to wear it uh, to fully appreciate. But the problem is it's so rare. Chances are, you know, for you to see one in the wild is extremely slim. This is the problem with everything new. If it's new, people are not going to like it. Like half the people aren't going to like it if it's new in the space. It's just guaranteed. So it's like I don't even listen to them anymore. Well, let me put my hand up as one of those people. <laughs> no, it's not that I don't like it. Are you familiar with the Disney cartoon Beauty and the Beast? Sure. Yeah, I, I see this watch and I think of Cogsworth. Good. Isn't that the clock? I don't know why, because they don't actually look very very similar but for some reason i see this and i think cogsworth from beauty and the beast but i do think you're right i think in the flesh and on the wrist this does look it takes what it transforms from what it is when you see a photograph of it online or sitting in a desk somewhere just out of interest just because many folk who are listening may not know this but a lang and zona have this i can't think what they call it is it a double is it just a double built They've got a phrase for it whereby they build the watch. Oh, where they, they assemble and disassemble all the movements? Yeah, so effectively the watch is assembled twice. So they assemble it the first time and then the whole lot's taken apart and then it's put back together again to see if it still works just as well. I, I, I'm not sure I'd like that particular watchmaker's job of having to well i'd be okay taking stuff apart i wouldn't be that good oh they love it it, probably do they they do it's cathartic for them and you know (laughs) yeah it's relaxing (laughs) it's not you know they get to look at it and, and understand it Look, this is how fancy, you know, automobile engines are are produced. They want to make sure that there isn't any hidden areas of wear and tear, that the parts fit together correctly. It's actually very wise that Along and Zona does it. It sounds very sexy when you hear it. It's like, oh, my God, they put it together and they take it apart. You imagine, like, someone breaking down a house. But a watchmaker <laughs> is skilled. It's like a, it's like a soldier is skilled. They're like, take your gun apart and put it back together. Like, it's kind of like what they do all day long. It's, do, it, it, do it blindfolded at the bottom of your bed while being shouted at by the sergeant major. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny because because when I mentioned this technique, this twofold assembly to somebody as a twofold other, assembly, that's the phrase. Yeah, well done. Thank you to somebody at yeah, some other brand. They said, "Oh yeah, well we don't do that. We just get it right the first time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> off the cuff." And I was like, "Okay, that's that's pretty good." <laughs> that's like what a salesperson would say. Well, it was, I mean, it worked, and most of the brands do it that way, so I guess it works. Good stuff. Well, that's the Elang and Zona in titanium, the Odysseus. So if you want to go and check that out, uh, have a look at the article on a blog to watch. From time to time, I really like talking about, you know, affordable watches and things that are a good option at the entry level. And, you know, there's not that many brands that you can sort of reliably go to. One of them is Timex. And what I did is I took two watches, one for men and one for women. Very similar in a lot of ways, kind of a similar dial. One is the men's M79 automatic. And for women, it is the Q Timex Malibu. These are both you know, really affordable watches in the scheme of things. The men's automatic it has a Japanese automatic in there. It's under three hundred dollars, and the women's is under two hundred dollars, uh, two eighty nine versus one eighty nine. Forty millimeters wide for the men's, thirty six for the women's. You know, the people that design these watches are Timex's design team in Milan. They're also the people that design things like their Versace and Ferragamo watches and things like that, and and they love classic watches. I just think that enthusiasts that don't have a lot of money are very fortunate because these are watches that are designed by people that sort of love vintage and classic watches and are trying to emulate something. And the thing is, these are very spot on for how these actual vintage watches were were made. Most of these vintage watches that get like a a re-release were not particularly luxurious, at least not in the way we think about today back then. And so it's actually a little bit more authentic for me to go ahead and get something like this and they have a good a good look to them they're they're fun especially the Q the uh the Q Malibu what they do is they have these sort of expando flex bracelets with alternating links that have a metal color or a lacquered color and it's a really fun look they kind of, they have different versions of it the 
expando flex bracelets have an easy adjust system where you don't need tools and you can sort of pull a link out which is not at all how those classic ones used to be so there's actually a lot of convenience features in these watches they look nice these aren't the only two colors but i also i just thought it'd be nice you know as a his and hers or because they look very similar to go ahead and look at these two timex watches i i, I don't know what do you guys think as a, an affordable option for an enthusiast well i think my first question is actually is this the first appearance on the website of misses a blog to watch no is she well known for wrist modeling the ladies watches when you get them in for review you don't want to see them on my wrist is all i can say (laughs) that is certainly the case your wrist is certainly significantly hairier than hers people in scotland have a bit of a unique relationship with timex because back in the day there was a very famous industrial dispute in dundee So Timex isn't necessarily that popular a brand in Scotland for those that know their industrial past. 38 people have been arrested and several policemen injured during a demonstration outside the Timex factory in Dundee. In terms of this product, I really like these. I I do find the original Timex cues are complete hair biters. The original originals? Why would you even have one of those? No, no, no. That no. Okay, not the original originals. The original re-releases that came out what three years ago would it be now? Oh yeah, those things. That was like a like a, I call those torture bracelets. Yeah, you might as well just have gone against uh, on your wrist with a pair of tweezers or waxed your wrist. But the strap on this one that you're wearing, the M seventy nine, looks slightly different. This is a brand new bracelet, so. I, I'm glad you brought that up because those original M79s had that th- thin metal bracelet that didn't even have a locking clasp, but had like this, you had to like finagle it with your hands, like kind of like a, a, I guess a woman's bracelet where you had to connect a clasp. And I, I hate that. I mean, these people, some brands have recome out with these things in Timex pretty quickly realized nobody wanted this thing (laughs) so they tried to engineer one that had sort of the look of these original ones with a traditional or i guess now traditional not vintage but a a, 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 and the expected fold over lock and deployant so this actual watch used to have a different bracelet meaning same color same bezel and things like that now it has an upgraded one um so just look for the one that has the folding deployant i you know it's just a company that i i I greatly appreciate i for me to do a luxury watch well is not all that extremely difficult. I know that sounds weird, but but to produce something that is comfortable, that looks good, that is durable, to a budget of a few hundred dollars at most, uh, is what makes me respect Timex, Casio, Seiko, Citizen hugely. You know, you can pick up a, a titanium bracelet Citizen for a few hundred dollars at most. You know, and and they had to learn how that metal works, and they have to know, you know how to work with it it's totally different to machine than uh to work with steel or or whatever else um and i feel like you know these brands and these watches even though they are not fifty six thousand dollars but you know a few hundred dollars at most they often deserve the same if not more respect than the big guns i mean th- those watches like today are like the quality of some of like people's like grail watches like a rolex from the like the 70s or something like that like that's basically <laughs> what those are i mean david and i've joked about this we've seen you know we know we know these old rolexes and like a modern you know seiko or timex is about as good as one of these you know i don't know what they are now eighty thousand dollar vintage rolexes well if you would rather buy a few hundred dollar timex than go searching for a vintage rolex it's the wise decision <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing to do there they, they will, they will be investment grade pieces any day now <laughs> uh, then go and check out the details on the article at a blog to watch WT Author is a brand I don't know a great deal about, and they're this week's sponsored post on a blog to watch. Uh, I should know a lot more about them because they're based in the UK. They're based in Shropshire. Uh, Who has experience, first of all, of the previous models from WT Author? No one. (laughs) No one. No one. I quite like the look of these newer ones. I have no experience of the old ones, but... This is a, a kind of Kickstarter type arrangement. You can go and check out the link on the website. And their kind of starter for 10 is basically, we're not trying to produce something that looks like anything else. This is kind of what we like. So it's what we're making. If you like it, then here's your chance to get on board. And they're certainly different. They're kind of a mix of, now, how many sides has that got? One, two, three, 
four, it's eight. five, six, seven. Is it eight sided? Is it octagonal? <laughs> So it's a, a kind of mix of octagonal bezel sitting in a square case. So a kind of, you know, love child of a Bell and Ross and a Royal Oak, I the, suppose. These aren't, these aren't bad. I, I call these video game watches. Uh, yeah. Because for me, what you have here is it's, you know, it's it's cockpit instrument style, yes. military dial. Hey, everyone, octagonal bezels are popular. Let's throw one of those in there. That's like the little trendy <laughs> mark. You know, it looks industrial. It's like a fashion watch for enthusiasts. You know, I think that what yeah. I love about these is they're not you're, not, you're not talking about terribly expensive. You know, these are the Kickstarter thing is like $450. Style wise, when I was newer on, I would have liked this. Some of these have those tinted crystals. So it's green. It looks like those, you know, in, those instruments and in like a plane. It's it's fun. It's, you know, I, I it, this stuff is fun. Again, once you become a more seasoned watch consumer, it's hard to go to these little brands. But I think once you do, people have a lot of fun. I know people that – I'm not saying they abandon their Rolexes and their Omegas. But they'll buy a few of these a year because sometimes these weird Kickstarter brands or their novel designs make people more happy than – the Rolex that's exactly how they expected it to be. So this is the final countdown collection. There seems to be like 10 variations of the watch, but all being produced in limited numbers. And I know they're fairly close to their Kickstarter raise with still, I think, a month left. I, I do like the green crystal. And I think you're right. I think these are the kind of watches that because they're only a few hundred dollars, if you are a collector, you're just going to have a couple of these kind of things. And this is that, that are just different that when you go to your watch meetup or whatever, you may, you may or may not wear this one into it, but you certainly take this one in your pocket to show off to everybody else, despite the fact that it's a $500 watch. I get a few of these per year. And I have to say, I, I oftentimes get more excited yeah. about them because they're new and they're weird. Yeah, you're right. I'm not necessarily wearing it to like a watch snob event, but if I'm just around town... These things can honestly get more attention, more praise, more compliments Absolutely. than a lot of things. I mean, if anybody compliments your Rolex, it's because they think it's expensive. No one's going to be like, wow, that's a great design. When you wear weird stuff like this, especially in particular parts of, of the world, you're going to get people complimenting how it looks. It doesn't even matter if it's, if it's, if, if it's actually subjectively nice. If it's just yeah. interesting and weird, people will comment. And that's... You know, it's hard to wear clothing that just someone in an elevator is going to comment on in a, in a good way. <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to be commented on in an elevator for your watch, then you can go and check out the WT author. The links, etc., are in the article to the Kickstarter raise. Uh, it's got about a month left to run. Resins came out with a new model called the Type 8 for 2022. It's an entry-level model for them. At 12,500 Swiss francs, which again doesn't sound like an entry level model, but they're one of many brands that decided, hey, we're now popular enough that we can come out with a, for us, entry level model that will be hard to get. It's sort of a strategy. And I say this because I don't think that anyone at Resonance before this sort of trend emerged was like, you know what we all need to do? Come out with an entry level model. The tendency is to actually get more complex. Um, of course, sometimes a little bit more elegant at times or a little bit more refined. But the the tendency from the creative perspective isn't to let's go back to the basics. But this is their response to, we'll call it a commercial or market request. And what they've done is they've stripped back pretty much all the complexity they're known for and created a dial that's sort of their you know signature mystery dial style that has just an hour and minute indicator. And it's I guess you could call it regulator style. I'm not sure exactly what you would call their dials because the whole thing kind of moves. They call it orbital time display or something like that. It's it's elegant. It's nice. It's titanium. It's well polished. There's no watches on the market that are as reflective as a Resonance. I mean, you know, a, a Panerai <laughs> by comparison has no glare, even though <laughs> Panerai's are glare city. So you know, shooting this thing is, is a nightmare. I, I feel like I spend as much time with these watches as I do because I'm just trying to get a good shot, none of which were particularly amazing from a glare perspective for our article. But you get a great idea of what the watch looks like to wear. I still have a very soft spot in my heart for Resonance. I remember when they were brand new. I saw them through a popularity cycle. I know, you know the struggles they have as a brand trying to find good suppliers and make sure their watches work great and deliver. It's a great concept that unfortunately sort of has to be expensive. So to some degree, 
you know, if $30,000 wasn't something you can spend on maybe their next cheapest model or something like that. Actually, they have some that are cheaper than that. I'm thinking about like the Type 3. And then you go, to, or actually the Type 3 is about 40,000. The Type 5, which is Diver, is about 30,000, which again are my more favorite ones. And it, But you want something a little bit more simple. I, again, I think they're going to sell these very, very well. I like to see more complexity, but it's a very marketable product. Yeah, I think my main disappointment in this, because I think this has the potential to be for resins what like the Chronomat Blue was for FP Journe, in that it was their cheapest one that was the most popular. Uh, it was their entry level that was actually the one that really got everybody's attention. But they've created it with 10 meters water resistance. I would be scared to wear this in Scotland. I don't know about the humidity where any of you guys are but i just don't quite understand why it can't be at least 30 meters or a bit it's more. not it's just not for scotland it says it on the case back not to be sold in scotland <laughs> cannot be sold there not for scottish <laughs> consumption do not sell to scots exactly when you buy multi-packs <laughs> of cans of things and it says not for resale individually on them exactly it just says on the back of this warning do not sell in scotland, scotland. <laughs> so there you go i'll shut up then so i, I i'm not allowed to sorry buy but they, watch, look so they I'll do have a diver the, the type 5 is a diver and you know it's maybe it's maybe it's scottish certified i'm not sure you can <laughs> it's try twice it the price though <laughs> isn't it weird that 10 meters you know if, if you look at it that way it should actually mean that you can go 10 meters deep with it but yeah, to us yeah. watch enthusiasts it says don't go anywhere near water with it <laughs> and yet it's called 10 meters you know it's it's ridiculous <laughs> i mean yes you're 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 spot on right i don't know what it is i mean i always have this thing about the speedmaster not being water resistant at 50 <laughs> Uh, let's let's ask resins and we will take it i will fill up a big tank of water that's exactly 10 meters deep and we'll take it to 9.9 and see what that's happens that's exactly what i was going to say if i were a diver i would choose five of the most ridiculous watches and go <laughs> down to their water resistance rating minus 10 centimeters that's what i would do uh -huh. and look at what happens and then claim on claim on the warranty and i thought those <laughs> car leaks. nerds were weird <laughs> <laughs> well what would be the, what would be very quickly what would be the five most ridiculous watches to wear dives this is clearly one of them just pick any speedmaster and let's take it to 49 meters and see most what minute repeaters oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's let's activate the minute repeater at 100 meters let's see what happens <laughs> it didn't say anywhere in the manual that you're not supposed to do that the grandmaster drowned well, I mean, that does lead me nicely segueing on to the, our final, <laughs> <laughs> our, our final, which is the Hublot uh, Big Bang Tourbillon Cathedral Minute Repeater, full ceramic. Now, let me quickly scroll down the article. I'm checking the water resistance right now as we speak. Does it say? I, I will check. Just keep talking. I, I will come back to you. <laughs> so this is Hublot producing what I think at least they're saying is the first fully ceramic minute repeater, which, you know, I, I suppose is an achievement of some sort. You know, I'm not sure whether if you're in the market for buying minute repeaters, you're really that bothered about the material that it's made of. You want it to be nice and loud, obviously. And from what I hear, this is nice, loud minute repeater. Has anybody seen this watch? Or was this wasn't at Watches and Wonders, was it? I haven't seen this specific watch, but I am familiar with this movement. And I am familiar with this case in ceramics. So in my mind, I'm marrying the two. I don't really know what it means that it's in full ceramic, like if this has a performance element to it hublot is a bit silent on the matter i see this as being a new opportunity to produce some of these movements this is an older movement that originated in the bnb era hublot purchased bnb concept which is this exotic movement maker a while ago and matthias boutet who was the uh, basically person running it i believe still works at hublot and that's where this architecture came from. It is a tourbillon minute repeater with a time. You know, maybe a little bit boring by today's standards in terms of the complexity. You're like, oh, it only does that. But again, for a long time, <laughs> tourbillon minute repeater was a, a pretty exciting thing. It's it's on the thinner side for sure. It's a pretty good performer. I've seen it chime before. It's manually wound. It, it runs at three hertz with 80 hours of power reserve. So it's not, it's not terrible in there. What I think is really great about it is that you have a very classic look 
of a minute repeater movement. So it's done a little bit in a modern way, but it's unlike most Hublots. This one definitely feels like a movement that would be in a very different, more classic watch. And for that reason, I think that it has a lot of merit because on the outside, it's this contemporary Big Bang in this really nice white ceramic material or black ceramic. And then it has this movement, which to see the movement front and back looks really nice. So for that collector, and this is a $300,000, nearly $300,000 watch. There's a, you know, there's a group of people out there. It's like, you know what I need? I need a daily wear watch, but it's got to have a turbine a minute repeater would be great as well to show off the mechanics. And you know, there's, there's, there's some of those watches on the market, yeah. not a huge amount. Uh, so the water resistance of this two hundred and ninety-five thousand US dollar watch <laughs> is drum roll. Yeah, drum roll is three atmospheres, which is thirty meters. And the, the funny thing is that actually in the press release, Ubel mentions twice that to say uh, they say until now it has never been possible. I'm quoting here to guarantee the water resistance of the case despite the movable trigger piece which operates the minute repeater. And then they go on to say, the monochrome ceramic is a very complex machine which complicates the design of the case which in turn can compromise the water resistance. So they seem pretty hung up on the concept of water resistance and yet it's rated 30 meters. So I wonder if it would actually still resist water down at like 29 meters deep. Well, listen, Hublot, get us one of these. I will personally learn to die because <laughs> it's something i've never done in order to take this down to 29 i think that would that would be another break the internet thing for a blog to watch to video we'll get ed down there because you lot can all dive you're all like diving folks aren't you yeah i don't know if you are david are you, you i'm you not dive? I, I, know, I don't i know zach that, so me and david will learn to dive in order to take our resins down to 10 or down to 9.9 and our Ublo minute repeater okay down to 29 and a half meters so the idea is that you will be winding your watch and i will be operating the minute repeater on mine down at 29.5 yeah. meters basically if anyone's wondering you know the, the point of this discussion is that you know we we, we started off by saying, oh, this watch is already 10 meters water resistance, which is, you know, the watch industry's way of saying don't go anywhere near water with it. <laughs> and it's just kind of funny that 30 meters is, is the same, just a little bit with a, with, just with a softer touch. Oh, it's 30 meters. But, you know, it, it, once you're sitting in the Ublo boutique and someone is handing this watch over to you and you ask about water resistance, the salesperson, I'm absolutely sure, will also tell you that, you know, just don't go near water with it, even though it's rated 30 meters. So that's the Swiss way of saying that. I'm really resisting this opportunity to talk about what these ratings actually mean and things like that. It's, I mean, we'll give we'll give you your own show to do that. You can wax <laughs> lyrical about the meanings of water resistance <laughs> and and the 19 other people that are interested can tune in. It is interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, actually, we should do. We will put together a water resistance show uh, on the Spending Time channel over the next few months and we can have a, an extended chat mm. about that so that is us for this week check out the Ublo article what's everybody got coming up David articles you've got ready to hit the website basically it's in the final phases with two new articles coming to introduce two new amazing uh, suppliers to the store one is a watch drawing artist and the other one is a collector of vintage original watch advertisements going back all the way to the 1930s and they just responded with uh, to the q and a's we sent out so there's a little q and a and a little profile on both of them and we'll be rolling those out very very soon it's you know they they actually had to have like new portrait images and stuff like that taken just for this uh, for this purpose because these are people who are just you know in their little bubble and they're drawing watches and they're collecting ends and they are not super or anything like that you know they just oh okay i have to like hire a photographer and make you know make myself presentable for this purpose so <laughs> so all that has happened and all that is done so that everyone can meet these uh, amazing people and you know just get a little bit of an introduction to their world through the store very very soon good stuff i what are you up to this coming week well we're planning a couple of a blog to watch events uh, probably two or maybe even three of them here in los angeles in near time so yeah it's going to be great to invite our audience members back to more things we would actually like to hear from you if you want in a blog to watch event in your city it is good for us to talk to brands and things like that to get some information especially in cities they might not otherwise think so as you reach out do us a favor 
favor and let us know if you are in a city that you don't think has been represented enough. Going to London soon and going to be meeting with um, a lot of industry people there. Always good to catch up and hear about what's going on in the world. It's a great opportunity to meet with people from Asia, for example, that come over there. You know, as the world is closed up, so has a lot of my own awareness of that market. And I'm deeply interested at the state of the watch industry in parts of Asia right now. There's just not a lot of optics on it. So um, that's something that I've been personally trying to, to, to figure out. Good stuff. Well, if you've been listening to this uh, podcast, and please leave a review, some nice five-star ratings. If you want to contact the show to tell us about anything we should be reporting on, or if you've got any comments you want us to read out on the show, or anything you want to say, then just email me directly at rick at a blog to watch.com. And if you're listening to this on the Spending Time channel, then please do also follow the show directly on a blog to watch weekly so that's it from us so it's goodbye from me and goodbye from this pair thank you everyone uh please check out the latest stories on the blog to watch and we look forward to coming to you next week with more watch news and of course reviews exactly goodbye everyone